how good the Lord is. Blessings to each of you indeed. Thank you so much for joining us this evening as we study the word of God. Can't tell you how delighted I am that you've taken the time out to join us here at the New Mount Olive Baptist Church as we engage the scriptures and as we teach the truth of the word of God so that we can all be better believers in the body of Christ. If you would, I ask you now to go with me to God in prayer. Gracious and eternal God, our Father, we stop now to say thank you. We thank you, God, for another day. God, we thank you for being a God who forgives us of all of our sins and trespasses against you. Lord, we pray now that as we prepare to study your word, that your word would enrich our lives, that we would, God, be able to explain your word to your people in such a way that it would edify them and educate them so that we can all be better for your glory. It is in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we offer this prayer and every child of God said, amen. Beloved, thank you so much. I'm going to go back. Pastor Kennedy and I started uh, this series in Matthew chapter number five, verses three through 12, as we talk about the Beatitudes. So this evening, I want to read verse three and verse 10, verse three and verse 10, reading from the New American Standard translation of the biblical text. Hear the word of God as it speaks to us. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 10, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is a word of the Lord. Thanks be unto our God. Again, our theme for this study is entitled Keys to Kingdom Living. So between the summary statement of Jesus's message in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, when he says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, the kingdom of for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. From that summary statement in that message and the Sermon on the Mount, we are given an account of the calling of Peter and Andrew, James and John, and Jesus calls them to come after him. And we're told in each of those accounts that they followed him and large crowds followed Jesus as well. So in the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount explains to those who follow Jesus. He explains what it means. It explains what it means to follow Jesus. And since the Beatitudes are this introductory part of the Sermon on the Mount, what we have to do is think of what What do they mean in view of them being a part of this introduction? What what do they mean being a part of the introduction? But what do they mean when we look at them against the backdrop of the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount? And the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, um, it gives us, if we would watch carefully, three Very um, intriguing episodes, if you will. The first one is the parable of the narrow gate, which is found in chapter 7, verses 3 through 14. And in this narrow gate, it's, it's this metaphor for a restricted or difficult gate. And the English Standard Version captures it like this. And it says, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. And hard explains what it means when we hear the word narrow. Jesus, in that particular episode or account, he paints this vision of what life in the kingdom is like and how one lives in such a way to bring such a kingdom life 
about in one's own life. And in conclusion, what he's suggesting is this. He is asking all of those who would seek to be his disciples. He is asking, are you willing to face the difficulties that living in this kingdom or this kingdom life, are you willing to embrace the difficulties that come with this life? The second one is the parable of the tree and its fruit intertwined with that of the wolves in sheep's clothing, which is found in chapter 7, verses 15 through 23. These parables teach disciples how to recognize those who are false spokesmen for God. If, if, if people have not incorporated the values of the kingdom of heaven by embracing and embodying the behaviors that the Sermon on the Mount instructs one to embody, they are not considered true spokesmen or true spokespersons for God. Now, in the third parable, it is found in chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, and this is the parable of the houses. The person who builds the house on the rock is the one who has done the hard work of putting into practice, putting into practice what Jesus has just said in the Sermon on the Mount. The storm that destroys the house may include life's difficulties, but it is not or it is not less, no less than the final judgment. One scholar says this, Craig Kinnamer uh, says this. He comments on the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. He says that Matthew intends this part of the discourse to not only challenge his community's opponents, but to prevent his community from becoming like those opponents. Jesus, both Jesus and Matthew they place emphasis in the Sermon on the Mount about practice. It's about practicing what Jesus says. It is this, this practice that we must live our lives in a kingdom way. And that is what the Sermon on the Mount is instructing us. The Sermon on the Mount put into practice is the central focus of what Matthew's gospel is for those who would desire to be disciples. So this introduction of these Beatitudes, we hear this word blessed. Blessed are they. Blessed. In each Beatitude, each of the Beatitudes, it sets this squarely in the wisdom tradition. And in wisdom literature, the point of this pronouncement of blessing, it motivates behavior. If I want to be blessed, this is the behavior that I must have. If I want to live this kingdom life and this is a, king, a key to kingdom living, this is, these are the actions that I must take in my everyday life. So these blessed are declarations in 10 to shine a light on the path and to teach us how to live before God. It shines a light on the path of our life, how we must, how we must govern ourselves each and every day. And then it suggests how we must live. It instructs us how we must live each and every day before God. Another scholar would suggest one Carter makes the case that the first eight the attitudes falls into two particular groups. He describes, further describes the first four Beatitudes as not personal qualities, but oppressive situations of distress or bad fortune, which are honored or esteemed because God's reign reverses them. Watch him say it again. This is what Carter says. He says, the first four Beatitudes they are described this not personal qualities, 
but oppressive situations of distress or bad fortune which are honored or esteemed because God's reign reverses them. He goes on to describe that the remaining four and what we see in, in verses 11 and 12, not as human circumstances, but as human actions, which express God's transforming reign until God's completion of it. So putting these two descriptions together, when you put the first four and the last ones together, he seems to suggest that the Beatitudes describe human actions, these last four human actions, which are the result of God's reign and address the oppressive circumstances facing the insignificant ones of an earthly empire. So those things that we see as situations that people find themselves in because of oppressive regimes, oppressive situations. It's the actions that we have that God guides in the final four that address those situations in the first four. So, Pastor, and I want to look at how we see what's happening. And this is a very different lens than a very different lens than traditionally the Beatitudes have been viewed from. Most of them have been viewed from a very spiritualized perspective. So when when Carter talks about this empire of heaven. We want we want to look at these in a way that we address what we believe are real life situations in today's society as as disciples or those who would be the disciples of the Lord. How are we to respond in the midst of all of the chaos, all of the crisis, all of the situations? So when when Warren Carter, the, the, the scholar suggests that. It's about this, this empire of heaven. He, he suggests this and he says, this empire of heaven conquers the empires of this world as believers, as disciples of Jesus, obey the king of heaven's empire, where it conquers there is justice and peace where the kingdom empire, where this where this heavenly empire or this empire of heaven conquers. There is justice and there is peace. And apart from the reign of God, an earthly empire knows nothing about a heavenly empire. But it's because of how how God reigns. It's about how God rules. And those of us who operate under the reign and the rule of God, we find ourselves responding to the oppressive situations that we see happening in society. There's another writer by the name of Mark Allen Powell, who says this, all of the first four Beatitudes speak of reversal of circumstances for those who are unfortunate. And this is very contrary to popular homiletical treatments of the Beatitudes, being poor in spirit, mourning, being meek and hungering and thirsting for righteousness or justice, are not presented here as characteristics that people should exhibit if they want to earn God's favor. Rather, these are undesirable conditions that characterize no one when God's will is done. He is arguing from this vantage point that, that traditionally we have seen these as this is the attitude or this is the spirit this is the way you should be. But what he argues is this is what happens when people operate outside of the will of God. People find themselves stuck in these difficult conditions. People find themselves in these difficult places. And when we see as believers, as disciples of God, as believers, when we see people in those situations, it is our 
biblical responsibility. We are mandated if we are going to accept the Beatitudes as a way of living a kingdom life, a key to kingdom living, a part of kingdom living is addressing oppression. It's addressing difficulties in people's lives. It's addressing situations and conditions that are unfavorable and unfortunate for other people's lives. So it is in these couple of verses that I've read, there is this debate over the meaning of poor in spirit. And it is framed by some who are scholars as a dichotomy between the economically poor versus a spiritualized understanding that equates to those with the right heart, attitude, the right um, aspect of being humble. And one writer, David L. Turner, puts it like this, those who admit their spiritual poverty. So choosing between the two, economically poor versus humble, may be perhaps a false dichotomy. In the sense, the Old Testament paints a picture of the poor as those who are economically poor or oppressed and crushed in spirit as a result of being in economic poverty. It has now crushed their spirit because they cannot afford to live life. So, so what we see in that is they are humbled in spirit because of the repeated existence or experience of being crushed in poverty. They, 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 they feel broken hearted. They feel crushed in spirit because they do not have the means to live life in the most equitable way. So the poor in spirit then are those who are economically poor, whose spirits or being is crushed by economic injustice. So they see no hope. They feel that they're in position of hopeless poverty. In fact, it's almost if they feel as if God has forgotten them and they feel that there is no hope and they feel as if they do not benefit from no one. It's as if they've been left by people, left by God, and there is no hope for them. So the phrase that they are poor in spirit it's, it, it does not mean that Matthew is speaking only of a proper attitude or an inward state. But Matthew is describing economic poverty as a way that it impacts literally the soul of a person. And we do know that there are people who, if they have to deal with Economic injustice. It's, it's, the, it's the wealth disparities that we see. It's the economic gaps. For example, it's when, when women are paid lesser wages solely because of their gender. It is not because they are not as excellent. It's not because they do not have the capacity. It's not because they do not have the skill set. It's not even because they do not have the academic stamina. It is often because in a patriarchal society, women are treated less than because of their gender, which oftentimes and in many situations can lead to them dealing with an economic disparity that could then cause them to be crushed in spirit. So this even goes further in Matthew's account to suggest those who have been deliberately put in an economic situation where it's, it's, it's harmful or hurtful because of the injustice of others, and now it has crushed their spirit. So they're poor in spirit 
because they don't have the resources to live life. Family can't, someone can't take care of their family. Someone can't take care of their responsibilities because of the injustice of others. And now it has led to them being poor in spirit. So, so there is this connection of verse 3 and verse 10 in that in the first and the eighth beatitude is this, because theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. Those who are persecuted on account of justice are persecuted because they have set out to live in a way and to speak in a way and to live in a way that they are operating in the obedient practices that are stated in the Sermon on the Mount and they are meeting the injustices that keep poor people poor and they meet these injustices with God's justice. And therefore, they are persecuted because they live out the justice of God's kingdom. So that's why you see a lot of people getting persecuted because they believe in social justice. Because they say that there is a problem in this system and I am going to fight against the system of economic injustice. I'm going to fight against the system that causes people to remain in poverty. I'm going to stand against it. And then they are persecuted because they take the sermon on the mount in such a way that they respond to the injustices that they see in society and that is where the black church should find its location right in the center of what the Beatitudes say that when we see an injustice particularly in the text an economic injustice the black church ought to be the first one on the scene fighting against that injustice to make a difference and that is what the Sermon on the Mount is arguing for us as believers that we should not see it and then disconnect ourselves from it. There has to be something about us that bothers us when we see that, that it, it causes us to want to mediate Christ to the world in the most pragmatic way that we see the injustice and we can't sit there and act like it does not exist. We have to then address what we see and find ways to fight against what we see as an injustice. That's what, that's what the text is suggesting. So when you see this, we live out the justice, God's kingdom. Notice what the text says, verse number 10, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Perhaps could be better translated persecute, persecuted for the sake of justice, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When disciples, for the sake of bringing justice to the poor in spirit, when they do this, it can oftentimes cost that believer, that disciple, to go through persecution. But when they do, they are in fact in the act of meeting the kingdom of heaven in real time. It is, it is, it is meeting the kingdom of heaven in real time when you're willing to be persecuted. We see this historically uh, in the life of Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. found himself fighting against economic injustice, poverty among black people. As he fought against this, he was persecuted even to the point that he was assassinated. The reality of it is, beloved, when we, when we live out this kind of life, we can experience the kingdom of of heaven now. So the keys to kingdom living, most of us look at this eschatologically. We think of it as a futuristic reality. But we can live in this kingdom experience. This as Carter, this this uh, this this scholar Carter says this empire 
of heaven. We can, we can live in this kingdom of heaven in the right now if we would follow what the Beatitudes and the Sermon of the Mount are instructing us to do. And watch again. I want to read it again. Blessed are those, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Go to verse 10. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of justice, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You don't have to, you don't have to be in heaven to live in the empire of heaven if you are willing to respond to the Sermon on the Mount in the way in which Jesus teaches it in the text. Beloved, if I can simply say one thing for you to remember this evening is that when we see injustice, particularly in the text, economic injustice, those of us who are willing to follow the scriptures must stand up against it. If you are a supervisor on the job and you see someone experiencing economic injustice and you have the ability to change that, change it. If you are a believer living in society and you see economic injustice and you have the capacity to fight against it, fight against it. But just know Persecution will come when you stand against injustice. The scripture also says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There is something about this kingdom living that God expects us to carry out while we walk on this side of glory. So when we see what's happening in verse 3, those who are poor in spirit, we have to be willing to say, I'll fight against it from the vantage point of verse 10 and said, even if I'm persecuted, mistreated, or mishandled, if I have to face difficulties, I'll face those difficulties because I believe in being obedient to what the scripture is teaching. If the scripture is teaching me to stand boldly against the injustice, I must do that so that those in verse 3 will not have to be under the pressure of that oppressiveness, but they can experience kingdom living on this side because they have no voice. But those of us who have a voice must be a voice for the voiceless. They have no power, but those of us who have power must exhibit power for the powerless. They have no hope, but those of us who have the ability to give hope must give hope to the hopeless. That is the response that we must have when we understand what it means to live this kingdom life. And that is a key to kingdom living. A key to kingdom living is when you're willing to fight against injustice, even if it means that you are persecuted for fighting against that injustice. God bless you. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious and eternal God, our Father. We stop now to say thank you. We thank you, God, for another day. Thank you for the bounty of blessings that you have so graciously bestowed upon us. We pray now, oh God, that there's someone watching, listening, and Lord, they have a sense that you're calling them to salvation. We ask now, God, that they would repent, admit that they've sinned, God, that they would ask you to come into their heart and ask Jesus to be Lord and Savior of their life. Believe by faith and be saved. God, we pray for the person perhaps who finds themselves now feeling convicted that you are God of another chance and they want to recommit their life to you. Let them at this moment know that they can have a new start. And God, for those who perhaps may be looking to join our church, wherever they may be located, if they're in this area or in any geographical location, they can be a part of what you're doing here in the new Mount Olive Baptist Church. We pray now, God, that you would give them peace about that decision. We thank you, God, for who you are. It's in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, that we offer this prayer. And every child of God said, amen. Again, beloved, thank you so much for joining us and being a part of what God is doing here in the New Mount Olive Baptist Church. We pray that if the Lord moves on your heart to connect 
on the screen, there are ways in which you can connect. If the Lord is moving on your heart to contribute on the screen, there are ways in which you can contribute. We thank you for joining us, and we pray that you will continue to read through the Beatitudes so that you will understand the keys to kingdom living. God bless you. I love you, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it.